Good morning. Welcome to the 2016 NASA Ames Summer Series. We are very honored today to have a very special guest. Today's presentation will be given by the Honorable Norman Mineta, former cabinet member under former President George W. Bush and former President Bill Clinton. Mr. Norman Mineta served as the 14th Secretary of Transportation under President George W. Bush and is the longest serving secretary in the Department of Transportation's history. As Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Mineta was the point of contact for all aircraft during the September 11, 2001 attacks, issuing an order to ground all civilian aircraft traffic for the first time in U.S. history. Prior to serving under President George W. Bush, Mr. Mineta served under President Bill Clinton as the 33rd Secretary of Commerce. Between 1971 and 1975, Mr. Mineta served as the 59th Mayor of San Jose. From 1975 to 1995, he sat in the United States House of Representatives, representing California's 13th and 15th districts. During World War II, the Mineta family was interned for several years at Area 24, 7th Barrack, Unit B, in the Hart Mountain internment camp near Cody, Wyoming, along with thousands of other Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans. Mr. Mineta was a driving force behind the passage of the Civ Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which officially apologized for and redressed the injustices endured by the Japanese Americans during World War II. Mr. Mineta is also a former vice president of Lockheed Martin Corporation. Mr. Mineta graduated from University of California, Berkeley School of Business Administration. We are very pleased to welcome Mr. Mineta here today. Thanks, Alvin. Olga, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, introduction. I, um, having been born and raised here in San Jose, California, I'm really pleased to be here at NASA Ames Research Center. There were times during my 11 terms in Congress that I came here to NASA Ames a, a number of times uh, because the center director was Hans Mark and Hans and I were students together at uh, Berkeley. <clears throat> so that friendship carried on from Berkeley to here, and then when he became Assistant Secretary of the Air Force. And, and I remember when I was a member of the House Intelligence Committee, and uh, he had told me he was coming as the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, and we were having a hearing of the House Intelligence Committee, and Hans was there. And I said, Hans, what are you doing here? He said, well, I couldn't tell you why I was here. And in those days, the word NRO was classified, as well as the uh, National Reconnaissance Office. So outside the committee room, we couldn't even say NRO or National Reconnaissance Office, and found out that he was the head of the NRO uh, when he came to uh, DC. Well, I am not a scientist by background. When I was in high school, my dad, who had been in the insurance business from 1920, said, you know, I want you to join me in the insurance business. And I said, no, no, Papa, I want to be an aeronautical engineer. So I started at Berkeley in aeronautical engineering, took uh, calculus, and then I decided for the safety of the country <laughs> and my own future, I better find something else to do. So I ended up in the insurance business, served, uh, graduated from Berkeley with an ROTC commission. The Korean War was going on and went straight overseas to Korea and then transferred to Japan and from 54 to 56 and then came back and joined my dad in the insurance business in 1956. 
little by little, I started getting active in the community. And in 1967, we had our first directly elected mayor of San Jose. And uh, so that created a vacancy on the city council. So the new mayor and two incumbent members of the city council came to me and said, would you consider putting your name in for that city council uh, vacancy? Because we're going to interview a number of candidates and uh, we'd like to have you in that mix. So I said, well, I better talk to my dad about that first since I'm in business with him. And uh, <clears throat> so when I talked to my dad, he said, uh, you know, we can decide how to manage the insurance business, but there's an old adage in Japan about people in politics. If you're in politics, you're going to be like that nail sticking out of the board. And he says, you know what happens to that nail? It always gets pounded. Now, do you think you'd enjoy being pounded by your friends, your neighbors, constituents? And I said, well, it's only for a two-year uh, unexpired term, and I can still stay active in the insurance business. And uh, so let me, let me see if I, can, uh, if I can do it. So he said, OK, and I applied and was appointed to fill that vacancy. And I did enjoy it. So in 1969, I then ran for a full four-year term and um, won the election. And then in 1971, the mayor who had been elected in 67 decided not to seek re-election. And by that time, I had been the uh, vice mayor of San Jose, and a lot of people said, run for mayor. So I did, and I was elected in uh, 71 as mayor. Uh, and I really enjoyed it because we were making that transition from an agricultural community to high tech. So when I first became mayor, the population was about 320,000. And in that four years, it had risen to 580,000. So whenever you see a city grow, you want to see it grow gracefully and not without warts. So you have to make sure that the roads are in place sewage treatment system is going to be able to handle the capacity of the community, parks, branch libraries. And it was really an exciting time. And I really enjoyed it. And uh, so um, uh, during that, it was really three and a half years, not, a, not quite a full four-year term. And then in 1974, I was elected to the Congress. Now, I just give you this as background uh, because the, what I consider, what I like to talk about are the whole issue of national security, transportation, and civil rights. Uh, so this is not going to be a science-oriented discussion as you've had in your wonderful summer series. And I'm really pleased to be asked to be part of the summer series talks. But probably the most seminal moment in my life was December 7, 1941. We had just returned from church, and it was probably 12.15, 12.30. The radio was already talking about the attack by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. And my dad being a community leader, people were calling in to wonder, what's the impact of what's happening in Pearl Harbor going to be on us? And people would drop by the house uh, during that day. And about 2 o'clock, uh, our next door neighbor, uh, Joyce Hirano, came running in the back door of our kitchen. And we had a hedge between our two homes with a little cutout down below so that Irving and Joyce from next door or me, we can go back and forth between our two homes. And so she came running in our house saying, the police are taking Papa away, the police are taking Papa away. So my dad run, ran out of our house, went next door, and by that time, Mr. Hirano was gone. Uh, and no one knew who came and picked him up. And uh, so he came home and he called the city manager and said, 
asked the city manager about this, and he said, I know, I don't know what you're even talking about. He said, but talk to the chief of police. So my dad talked to chief of police Black, and he said, I don't know anything about it, but you ought to talk to Sheriff Emig. So he called Sheriff Emig, and Sheriff Emig said, I know what's going on. It's not my operation, it's FBI, and I'll talk to the FBI and have them come talk to you. Well, about four o'clock that afternoon, the FBI agent actually came to the house and said that they were picking up people who they thought might be sympathetic to the Japanese cause and community leaders. Well, my dad sort of felt insulted because he felt himself to be a community leader, and yet the FBI weren't, wasn't talking to him or picking him up. So after the FBI agent left, uh, my mother and dad uh, packed up a suitcase just in case the uh, FBI came back, which uh, fortunately they didn't. But the whole Japanese American community uh, was pretty much in turmoil after that. And there was a, a commanding general of the Western Civil Defense Command by the name of uh, Lieutenant General John D. De DeWitt and uh, that covered Washington, Oregon, California. And he had coined the phrase, once a JAP, always a JAP. And he thought if they could attack Pearl Harbor, they could probably attack the west coast of the United States. And if they attack the west coast of the United States, what am I gonna do with 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry living in Washington, Oregon, and California. And um, on February 12th of 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, delegating to the Secretary of War the ability to evacuate and intern persons. It didn't say German, Italian, or Japanese, it just said persons. Well, <clears throat> General DeWitt used Executive Order 9066 to commandeer uh, racetracks and county fairgrounds in uh, Washington, Oregon, and California and ordered the evacuation of those of Japanese, evac of, uh, Japanese ancestry. And I remember when those signs went up, there were big placards and it said instructions to all those of Japanese ancestry, alien and non-alien. As a 10-year-old kid, I looked at that sign and I said, what, what's a non-alien? And my brother was nine years older than me, and he said, that's you, a citizen. I said, well, why aren't they calling me a citizen? Now, <clears throat> I'm not sure when the last time any of you stood up pounded your chest and said, I'm a proud non-alien of the United States of America. I don't think you have. And that's why to this day I cherish the word citizen because our own government wasn't willing to use the word citizen in describing those of us who were American citizens born here but of Japanese ancestry. And so all of a sudden here were 120,000 people because we look like the people who attacked Pearl Harbor being forcibly removed from our homes and evacuated and put into racetracks and county fairgrounds. The reason those facilities were commandeered was because they had built-in living quarters, namely the horse stables. And so by the time we were being evacuated from San Jose, that was May 29, 1942. And so we boarded the train here in San Jose and went down to Los Angeles to the Santa Anita uh, racetrack where we, were, uh, where we were interned. Luckily, by the time we got to Santa Anita, all the horse stables had been, in, had been um, occupied. And so they had some barracks buildings that were built in the parking lot at Santa Anita Racetrack. And <clears throat> so our family was 
put into those um, into those um, barracks buildings. Now, <clears throat> by November of <clears throat> 42, <coughs> we were moved from Santa Anita to Hart Mountain, Wyoming. And Hart Mountain is about 20 miles east of Cody, Wyoming. And Cody is about 25 miles east of Yellowstone National Park. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> so we got there in November of 42, cold, blustery day, and uh, that's, that sand was pelting our faces, and, oh, thank you, and the, um, the sagebrush was uh, tumbling along, and being Californians, we, we just weren't uh, used to this kind of California or uh, Wyoming weather. <clears throat> and we didn't have clothing to really help us uh, or protect us from that cold. So uh, we were in, in these barracks buildings now in, uh, uh, for the duration of World War II. And uh, in order to keep the young uh, girls and boys occupied, the camp elders had written to the Boy Scouts of America and Girl Scouts and said, come and organize troops in the camp. So we had seven or eight Boy Scout troops. And our leaders would write to the Boy Scouts in the surrounding community in Ralston, Deaver, Cody, and other communities saying, come on in and join us for our jamboree. And they would write back and say, oh, no, no, we're not going to go in there. There's barbed wire all around the camp. There are military guard towers every 300 feet with searchlights and machine guns. Uh, those are POWs. We're not, we're not going to go in there. And our scout leaders write back and say, no, no, these are not POWs. They're Boy Scouts of America. They wear the same uniform you do. They read the same manual you do, and they go after the same merit badges you do. And so eventually a troop from Cody, Wyoming came in and we had our knot tying contests and our woodworking contests and how to start a fire without a match and all those things that Boy Scouts do. And then we got paired off with a, with a kid from the Cody Boy Scout troop. And so this kid and I put up our tent and in Wyoming it could rain a lot or not rain and so in order to protect your tent, you build a moat around the tent. So this kid and I build our moat. Then he said, there's a kid from my troop in that tent below us, and I don't really care for him. Would you mind if we cut the water to exit that way just in case it rained? And it was really no skin off my nose, so I said, sure. So we built a beautiful moat cut the water to exit that way. And as luck would have it, it started raining that night. <laughs> and our moat worked perfectly and water drained down there. And during the course of the night, that tent came down. The tent pegs pulled, tent came down. The kids in my tent with me going, hee, 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 ha, 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 ho, 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 laughing all night long. And I finally said to him, Alan, would you please shut up so we get some rest? His name was Alan Simpson. And he eventually became the US Senator from Wyoming. <laughs> and in 1974, I was elected to the House. In 1978, he was elected to the Senate. And our friendship went back as if we were still sitting in that pup tent in 1943. And to this day, we're still the closest of friends. In fact, last uh, December, we went on a, at least once a year, we always take a vacation somewhere together. And last December, we uh, took a two-week cruise uh, in the first two weeks of December. And we still maintain this wonderful, wonderful uh, friendship. Well, let's fast forward to 9-11, 2001. I was Secretary of Transportation, and I was having breakfast that morning with the Deputy Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, Belgium, 
who was also the Minister of Transport. And I had with me Jane Garvey, the head of the Federal Aviation Administration. And um, about 8.15, 8.30, uh, my Chief of Staff came in and said, uh, Mr. Secretary, may I see you? So I excused myself, went from the conference room into my office, and at the other end of the office was a TV council, recognizable World Trade Center building, black smoke pouring out. I said, well, what's all that about? He said, we don't know. We've heard the possibility of general aviation into the building, commercial aviation into the building, or an internal explosion inside the building. So I looked at the TV and did some channel surfing, listening to the commentary. So I said, John, now keep me posted. I'm going back into the breakfast. So I went back in and explained to Mrs. Duran and to Jane Garvey what I had just seen on TV. Seven, eight, ten minutes later, he came back in and said, may I see you? So I went back into the office. And he said, um, it was a commercial airliner that went into the World Trade Center. So then I went up and I started <clears throat> listening to the commentary and watching the news. And as I'm standing there watching, see this gray object come across the screen, disappear, and then from this side of the screen, this white, yellow, orangey, billowy cloud. I go, holy cow, what, what was all that about? Or words to that effect. <laughs> and uh, so then I really started listening to the commentary and watching the news. And um, so after doing that for five, seven minutes, I went back into the conference room and I said, I don't know what's going on in New York City, but Jane, you've got to get back to the operations center at FAA and Mrs. Duran, I'm just going to have to excuse myself because I know I'm going to have to be dealing with this. Well, by the time I got back into my office, someone from the White House had called and said, get over here right away. So I grabbed some government manuals and some papers and put them in my briefcase and went over to the White House. And as we're driving in, people were running out of the executive office building and out of the White House. And I said to my driver and security guy, I said, is there something wrong with this picture? We're driving in and everybody else is running away. So I get out of the car, went into the White House, and they said, uh, you have to be uh, briefed by uh, Dick Clark, the uh, security advisor. So I went into the situation room and got briefed then he said, um, you've got to be in the PIOC. I said, PIOC, what's that? He said, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center. And I said, I have no idea what that is or where it is. And there was a Secret Service agent standing there, so he said, I'll take you. So this is that bunker that's way under the White House that's supposed to be uh, nuclear bomb proof. And let's hope we never have to test that. But uh, anyway, I went down there and got there, and the vice president and uh, Mrs. Cheney were already there. And um, so um, uh, there's a big table there, probably 30, 40 feet long, 12, 15 feet wide, with chairs all around it. And between each of the chairs are phones. So I set up this phone here to the Department of Transportation and said, don't hang up keep the line open. This phone here I set up to the operations center at FAA and said, keep it open. And uh, stayed there the balance of the day between those two phones. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so a military assistant came into the vice president, said there's a plane coming towards uh, DC. So I said, Monty, uh, what do you have on radar plane coming towards DC. Monty had been a, started at FAA as an air traffic controller and had risen over the years, now was the number two person within the FAA. And uh, so he said, well, we're, we're tracking one plane, but the transponder's been turned off, 
So all we're doing is following the blip on the radar, and we don't know anything about the plane. Well, on my desk, on my credenza behind me, there was a monitor I had, and it has an outline of the 48 states in Alaska, Hawaii. And it would be peppered with dots. If I took my mouse and put it on one of those dots, then a flag would come up, and it would say, um, UA-123, United Airlines Flight 123, uh, B-752, Boeing 757 Series 200. And then it would say uh, PVD and the number of navigational points, ORD. So that meant it left Portland, flying these navigational points, final destination, O'Hare, at Chicago. Then on the second line, it would show compass direction of the plane, speed, how much fuel in the plane, and a lot of other things about the airplane. So here in this instance, the transponder had been turned off, and they were just following the blip on the radar screen. And it's hard to look at a radar screen and relate it to a point on the ground. So when I asked Monty, I said, well, where's the plane? He said, well, somewhere maybe in the middle part of Pennsylvania. So every so often, I'd be asking him, where is the plane? Well, probably north of Baltimore now. Where is the plane now? Uh, probably near Roslyn. Where is the plane now? Somewhere between Pentagon City and National Airport. Where is the plane now? Monty, where is the plane now? Uh, Mr. Secretary, we just lost the, the bogey. Where would you lose it? Somewhere between Pentagon City and National Airport. And then about that time, someone broke into the phone and said, Mr. Secretary, we just got a phone call from an Arlington County police officer who saw an American Airlines go into the Pentagon. And I said, Monty, that's the third commercial airliner used today in the last two hours as a missile. Now, in the military, they have something called a stand down, where they bring everything to a screeching halt and then try to figure out what's going on, try to eliminate some element one by one. So I said, Monty, we've got to do our own stand down. And we're going to start it by bringing all the planes down. Now, at that point, we had uh, 5,138 airplanes in the air over the US. And uh, so Monty said, uh, being an air traffic controller, he said, we'll bring all the airplanes down per pilot discretion. I said, Monty, screw pilot discretion. I want all the planes down. Because I didn't want a pilot over Albuquerque or Phoenix figuring, well, I'll just keep going into LA, my uh, destination. I wanted all those planes down as soon as possible. And in two hours and 20 minutes, we had 5,138 planes down on the ground safely and without incident. Now. Um, that morning, Tuesday, September 11, <clears throat> I had pulled three people out of ACS, Aviation Civil Security of the FAA, and moved them over to my office and said, start working on a new security regimen so that we can allow the airlines to go back into the air. So I brought them all down on Tuesday morning and we weren't able to get the regulations out until late Friday afternoon uh, on the new uh, security regimen. On Thursday, uh, we had a uh, cabinet meeting with the House and Senate Democratic and Republican uh, leadership. And uh, towards the end of that meeting, Congressman David Bonnier from Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, said, Mr. President, we have a very large population of Arab Americans and, and Muslims. And there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of rhetoric in the print media and the electronic media about prohibiting Middle Easterners and Muslims from flying. And uh, so when I had checked with our ACS team putting together the new uh, security regiment, 
the one right at the top of the list of things that they were looking for. The first one was no racial or ethnic profiling. And so during that meeting after President, after uh, Congressman uh, Bonnier had expressed his concern about the rhetoric about banning Middle Easterners and Muslims from flying, or even about rounding them up, President George W. Bush said, David, you're absolutely correct. We're equally concerned about the rhetoric we're hearing and seeing, but we don't want to have happen today what happened to Norm in 1942. And uh, so uh, that was a real signal to me to say, and President Bush didn't know what we were doing in terms of aviation civil security, but for me, it just gave me a great deal of confidence that we were on the right track. And then on Monday, the 17th of September, <clears throat> the president met with a large group of Arab Americans and, and uh, Muslims at the Islamic Study Center in Washington, D.C. And he said, we know who did that last Tuesday. They weren't loyal Arab Americans. They weren't faithful followers of Islam. They were terrorists, and we're going to go after them. And then towards the end of September, there was a shooting in uh, Arizona. And the person who had been killed was the owner of a gas station with a mini mart. And when they apprehended the killer, they asked him, why'd you kill the, the owner of this uh, gas station mini mart? He said, because he looked like the enemy. He was a Sikh and he had a turban, facial hair, leg bindings. And his sole explanation was, he looked like the enemy. And uh, so again, here we saw traces of people making judgments on their own based on what I had experienced in 1942, the fact that I looked like the people who had bombed Pearl Harbor. And so what we have to do is to make sure that as we're doing as we're doing things to ensure our national security, that we also are doing things to protect our own civil liberties. All of us have to be vigilant in the protection of our constitutional rights. We don't have to be vigilantes, but we do have to be vigilant in the protection of our constitutional rights. And so when I think of December 7, 1941, September 11, 2001, and then with all the tragedies uh, that we see and hear about in the, in the print and electronic media, uh, it just uh, makes me sick about what's happening. So all of us have to be protective about our constitutional and civil rights. But we also have to make sure <clears throat> that we're not making judgments about others. Wrongfully or put them in an adverse, um, adverse uh, light. So maybe uh, at this point, uh, Dr. Jake uh, Cohen, I'd, uh, I'll stop the, my uh, talk and open it up to questions that uh, you may want to ask. And um, so, Aga, are you going to moderate this yes, Q&A well, period? First of all, we want to thank you, Mr. Mineta, for that fascinating... <laughs> For giving us that fascinating viewpoint, especially from the inside, so we don't we wouldn't have normally gotten that. So appreciate that. And now we have time for questions. So if you raise your hand, someone will come and bring you a mic. One over there. 
Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, I thought it was very interesting what you just described, because if we listen to the Republican convention yesterday, it was similar in this kind of xenophobia that's being discussed and discussion about building walls and exiling people for their religious beliefs. How do you feel about this? And what, do you, what are your opinions about what's going on? Next question. <laughs> well, uh, I think really, first of all, um, I don't want to get into any partisan politics, but I sometimes wonder after hearing a lot of this, hearing the rhetoric and reading the press, I wonder what, what progress have we made? Are we reverting back to the 50s and 60s today? And that's why I say that we have to be very careful about protecting our own constitutional rights and uh, making sure that what our judgments are, are uh, don't reflect negatively. This country to me is a great country and it was put together even from the Constitution, remember it says to form a more perfect union. So democracy is not a static uh, event. It's something that's evolving. It's something that's growing. And we, we make in our democratic society, with a small d, we make, a, uh, we make progress. And that whole progress is to form a more perfect union. And uh, so it does uh, alarm me in terms of some of the rhetoric that's going on. And uh, so it makes us uh, have to be that much more careful about what we're hearing and, and uh, seeing. And uh, so it's, um, all elections are critical, but it seems like 2016 even becomes even more critical. Good morning. Um, what would you consider to be your greatest achievement? You've had such a storied life so far. Um, I really enjoyed my term as uh, mayor of San Jose, of setting the groundwork for the city that was 580,000 population at the time when I left, and now at about 1.1 million. And, uh, but I think from a legislative perspective, um, I think, um, of the uh, <clears throat> legislation I authored in 1991 called the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, I-S-T-E-A, and it got to be known as ICE-T. And, um, and it was the first rewrite of highway law since 1956 when President Eisenhower signed the National Defense Highway Act of uh, 1956. So in 1991, I had the opportunity to be the principal author of this ICE-T legislation. The first word was intermodal. And for the first time, I had introduced transit as part of the whole discussion about transportation. In the past, it had always been roads and bridges. So in 1991, I had uh, introduced uh, transit as part of that formula. Also in that legislation, I included $1 billion for IST, Intelligent Transportation Systems. And um, so, <clears throat> uh, again, it was trying to, it, encourage people to look at new and innovative ways to uh, work on transportation issues. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers, I tell this 
tell you this little side story. The American Society of Civil Engineers had designated that as landmark legislation and made me a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And when I boarded the train in 1942 to go off to camp, I was in a Cub Scout uniform and a baseball, baseball glove and a baseball bat. And as I got on the train, the MPs confiscated my bat. And I went running to my father crying, saying the MPs took my bat away. He said, that's all right, we'll get it replaced. Well, there were no stores in Santa Anita, the racetrack, so I never got my bat replaced. But a fellow from Los Angeles wrote and said, congratulations on becoming a fellow of the ASCE. And I was very touched by the fact that you lost your bat when you boarded that train. And I'd like to share with you a bat from my own collection. So I opened up this box, and here's a bat signed by Hank Aaron, home run king of the United States, and Sadaharu O, oh, the home run king of Japan. So I wrote a letter profusely thanking this person for this wonderful gift. And a reporter from the San Jose Mercury News heard about my getting the bat, wrote about it, being an enterprising reporter, went to a sports uh, <clears throat> memorabilia shop, found out the bat was worth $1,500. Well, the gift limitation for members of Congress was 250. <laughs> so I had to pack up the bat and sent him a letter saying, I can't accept it because as wonderful a gift as it is, the gift limitation doesn't allow me to accept the gift. So anyway, I sent a copy of that letter to the reporter and on that, his letter I wrote on there, the damn government's taken my bat again. <laughs> so I think of ice tea as significant uh, in my life as a legislator. And then the other was the uh, Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which was to redress the uh, uh, unconstitutional evacuation and internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Oh, there's a question over there. Uh, thank you for presenting today. My question is why um, my question is, why is high-speed rail so difficult to implement here in this country? I'm not talking about across the country, but let's say between the Bay Area and the Los Angeles area. Thank you. <clears throat> the whole concept of high-speed rail, um, a national high-speed rail system, uh, would be a very, very costly proposition. I think what we will have are regional high-speed systems. Uh, let's say San Diego to San Francisco, uh, Portland to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia through Seattle, probably um, the Midwest in terms of uh, Detroit to Chicago, down through St. Louis to uh, New Orleans, uh, something in Texas, something in Florida, um, but I don't think we'll have a national high-speed rail system, but we will have regional high-speed rail systems. The other thing is that we have got to educate ourselves and uh, also from an engineering perspective. The U.S. definition of high-speed rail uh, varies or is very different from what uh, our um, uh, friends who have high-speed rail. Our definition of high-speed rail is 150 miles an hour. In Japan, it's uh, 250, and they're now building a maglev system to go 350 miles an hour system. It'll go from Tokyo to Nagoya, and it'll take 45 minutes at 350 miles an hour. Uh, France has 250 miles an hour in Germany, Switzerland, uh, as their standard. And they run their high-speed rail on dedicated tracks. Our high-speed rail will be Amtrak running on freight rail. So freight rail, when they do their maintenance, 
they build it to 79 miles per hour. So uh, right now, where we say to them, build it, we run our railroads on your tracks, so please maintain them to be able to go 150 miles an hour. And uh, what we will have to do is to have our own dedicated high-speed rail uh, system apart from, from the reliance on freight rail. So until we get to that point of having our own high-speed rail as we're building here in California, um, and it, it will eventually be San Diego, LA, LA, um, up the Central Valley, San Jose to uh, San Francisco. But to right now they're building the Bakersfield to Modesto portion of it. Um, mainly I think it was done because of the uh, two things. One, the quickness with which they would be able to get the rights of way between Bakersfield and Modesto and the cost of it. Uh, the cost of building and getting the rights of way through Los Angeles uh, would be a very expensive proposition. But uh, I think we'll still see it probably in the 2025 20, uh, time frame. Hi, um, I speak as a uh, fan of high-speed rail myself. I love taking the train in Europe, but you yourself have just pointed out some of the problems with it. And I'm wondering if maybe we should consider that the successors to high-speed rail already exist or, or are on the verge, on the cusp of coming into being. And should we as a nation, or we as California, start looking at these alternate technologies and sort of hopscotch over high-speed rail? Well, the only hopscotch technology would be MacLev. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you're going 350 miles an hour, you really can't be on the surface because all that going by you would just uh, be, um, I think, maybe dizzying. So the one from in Japan, uh, MacLev, is all being done in a tunnel from uh, Tokyo to Nagoya. And uh, that will be ready, completed, I think, in about 2021 for operation. Now, the Chinese do have a uh, maglev in uh, Pudong to the uh, Shanghai airport. And it's about 19, 20 miles long. And it gets up to about 250 to 300 miles an hour. But it takes about takes them about three minutes to get up to 250 miles an hour, and then they're breaking the rest of the set way into Pudong Airport, and uh, it's the first commercial um, maglev project in the world. But uh, it's still not um, the kind of a system that probably yeah. will be operational. Uh, over a long period of time. The one in Japan will be. Yes, sir. Um, you talked about 9-11 and tracking airplanes, and lately we've had a bunch of airplanes just disappear, and possibly people turning off things that are in the airplane. Uh, we have technology now to track everything. How, how comes it's so hard to get, and we, you know, when we do, we have to dive down and find these analog devices that are crushed. How comes it's so hard to get a system so that we can actually track and find out what's going on in airplanes? It doesn't sound like it would be that difficult or, you know, at least technically. No, you're right. In 2004, um, I created something called the Next Generation <clears throat> Air Transportation System, and um, GNATS. A lot of people said the secretary can't spell NATS, but it's, um, and that is now known as next generation or next gen. And what we were trying to do then was to go from ground-based radar to space-based. And um, part of it became budgetary. 
Uh, part of it became um, resistance from the unions about moving to space based. And um, like in that recent Egypt Air, or even in the uh, case of the uh, Malaysian Airlines, uh, if we had had a space based uh, radar, uh, we would have been able to pinpoint where the plane went in and without having to look for the FDR, the flight, da flight data recorder, reporter, recorder, or the cockpit uh, voice recorder, and we'd be able to trace them. Today, <clears throat> and I've been part of an effort in a public-private partnership, P3, to try to get next gen and we've raised over $2 billion to build satellites to uh, house this ADSB receiver uh, for, or transmitter for, for space-based uh, air traffic control. The FAA is still fighting us on this. NAV Canada, a private uh, nonprofit air carrier, air traffic management force has put some 60 million of their money into it, the UK and the Europeans have. And so now we will be launching our first satellite in uh, July out of Vandenberg to start this series of 66 balls in the air satellites for, for um, space-based air traffic control. The Europeans are part of this, and so when they're using it, the uh, distance between aircraft will be five nautical, mi mi five nautical miles. But when they transfer that aircraft to US control, then the planes are gonna have to go to 13 nautical miles of distance. So that means that US, when the planes are coming into US territory, they'll have to slow down and, and increase that distance between the airplanes. So we're hoping that the, uh, the 66 ball system will be up in about a year and a half and we'll be able to uh, get um, greater air traffic management uh, system in place. As all of you know, uh, you're also working on air traffic management here at uh, Ames. Okay, so we want to wrap it up here and thank you again for being here and sharing. Thank you for the invitation to be here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.